their development team. I graduated from Algonquin College this past April, and I've been working with Foci Solutions since August. After the long journey to find what I'm passionate about in life and where I wanted to go and who I wanted to be, I'm finally able to work every day in a role that combines my technical attention to detail with my creativity. I'm fortunate to be able to work every day in a role that combines my uh, creativity when designing and developing the user experience and user interfaces for websites. I can use my creative mind to problem solve in unique ways. Foci is actually the plural form of the word focus. Uh, which is a priority at Foci Solutions, multiple points of focus. And we take a problem and we look at it in as many different ways as possible to determine the best way to approach it. And my creative view has allowed me to add a different perspective to my team. It's allowed me to add an extra point of focus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kendra. It's really cool to see how uh, you built on your high school co-op experience, despite the fact that you're no longer in uh, the law field, um, as well as hear how you've incorporated all your different hobbies that you've been involved in throughout your life into your career that you're into now. So thank you very much. I'm sure we'll have some more um, questions for you later, uh, especially about the like where you learned about coding, and but we'll get back to that later. Um, next, I'd like to hear from um, Min. Min, can you introduce yourself to, to the group? Yes, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, um, it's hard to follow the other two speakers because I don't really have anything prepared in advance. So I'm just gonna speak my mind and if it comes out all muddle, I apologize. But uh, it's great to be with this panel. Um, I've always had a passion for training students that despite what kind of work I'm doing, I always look for opportunities to work uh, with students. Um, where I am now, um, I have to say it's all, I, I wouldn't call it a big mistake, but it wasn't planned in any way. I never planned to, to go to graduate uh, school. I never planned to do postdoc or, or anything like that, in fact, I was having a great time doing my undergrad um, in uh, in the social sciences, and you know I was working as a waiter at a local restaurant, which I you know had a lot of fun because we had a lot of people the same age hang around. We go out after work, you know, to to uh, to places, and and it was life was great, and I thought that was it for me. Um, for, uh, fortunately, I had a great mentor. Um, he, he sort of said, you know, I, I know you're having a good time now, but um, you need to think about 10 years from now, what you like to do, you know, what would you put on your CV? You know, what is it that interests you beyond what you're, you're studying right now? And, you know, I, I was lucky to take on this. Um, uh, so following his advice, I took on this research assistant position where, um, you know, I was, I was over the moon because I, I was given a rental car that I could actually drive to this small communities uh, to do these uh, health studies. Um, my job was to interview these people in this area where they're exposed to high levels of environmental contaminants, um, mainly was arsenic, cadmium, lead, and so on. And so I was trained to interview people, collect information. I had not a clue what they do with it. Um, so I was interested in it. So I, I, I asked the, um, the scientific advisor of the study who happens to be the chair of the epidemiology department at the University of Ottawa, and I said to him, you know, uh, all this stuff I'm collecting, what do you do with it? You know, and he says, well, um, what do you think we do with it? And I like, oh, I don't know. Like, you know, this is all, you know, all this stuff. And not only interviewing people, we're collecting, collecting urine samples, we analyze for uh, contaminants and, and so on. And then he, uh, um, he says, well, are you interested in epidemiology? Which at the time I didn't really know what it was. And, um, um, you know, and I asked him, well, what, what's this feel like? And so he explained to me, and the other question I asked him is, what are the chances of me being employed, um, you know, after I go through the program? And he says, he looks at me, he says, you know, I've been in the chair of this department for 15 years and all my students are employed. I said, okay, that's pretty cool. You know, let's, let's apply. So it kind of snowballed from there. I did my master's at the University of, of Ottawa in the Department of Epidemiology and Community Medicine which after that I thought, okay, now I'm done. You know, I was, I had a job then with another uh, private consulting firm doing, you know, a few more studies, but just one thing led to another. I continue on uh, to my doctorate uh, uh, studies at the University of uh, Toronto. 
Um, you know, and after that, I thought I was done. You know, I, I just keep on looking for this this job um, that I'm, you know, finished with school. Um, but the thing is, I love school. Uh, I actually really miss school uh, in many ways, so both when I was in high school, when I was in university, um, I, I loved it. So I always maintain an academic relationship with it, despite, uh, you know, my current work now. And then uh, after finishing my doctoral, uh, there was a opportunity uh, in Barcelona, Spain, that um, my supervisor linked me to. And so we, um, we end up there for almost two years, I would say. Uh, working there in in the area of uh, health effects uh, associated with exposure to uh, low levels of ionizing radiation, but you know sometimes your acad your, your academic training change, and um, we decided that when we were expecting a second child, you know my wife sort of told me and said, you know. Mm -hmm. We need some benefits and you know you need a real job you stop playing around in school you know? so sure enough uh you know i i, I um I, I we decided to go back to ottawa where where we grew up and i i started with the public health agency of canada uh, as a senior epidemiologist uh this is right in the uh in the max middle of the pandemic h1n1 you know back in 2009 2010 and i still remember that day very clearly because um we flew back I think March 30th, and um, I was supposed to, to start uh, with a public health agency on uh, um, April 1st, which was April Fool's Day. But okay, this is kind of it's kind of weird, you know. But uh, that day sort sort of stuck. So I was very glad to do that because I, uh, despite you know, all the academic training, I still learn a lot uh, with the uh, with the agency. Uh, fortunate to work with lots of great people. Um, you know, the learning curve is is ongoing because the nice thing with working for government is there's always priority files, and you are sometimes you go from one one topic to another. You know, after the uh, the pandemic, uh, H1N1, for example, I, I moved to another department, another area within within fact. Um, I work on the opioid crisis. Uh, I work on um, um, autism file, a number of very interesting file. Um, I was there for almost 10 years and decided I need some exposure in the regulatory world. So I moved over to Health Canada and the consumer product safety. Um, and this is where I, you know, we encountered the issue of vaping and lung illness disease. And, you know, cannabis was new, new product that's being legalized. And, you know, there are children who are exposed to, to these kind of things. So it was really neat to see the health side marrying with the regulatory side and how decisions were made, you know. And so right after that, um, I recently, uh, not recently, I guess almost a year now, um, I decided to move over to the Department of National Defense, uh, right in the Force Health Protection Area. Um, but uh, so far, because of the COVID-19, I haven't, um, I wanted to actually focus on the area of mental health and, uh, and addictions and, and so on. But uh, um, because of the COVID uh, issue, I, I've been pulled from, from that file, but uh, just almost 100% of my time right now is just to focus on uh, COVID-related work. So that sort of career path in a nutshell. Um, hopefully it makes sense to people, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that anybody had. If I can, I will answer it. If not, uh, you know, I'll, I'm sure I could uh, find a link for you or, or something like that. So again, Glad to be here, happy to, to join the, this forum, and I'm looking forward to uh, discussions and, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Min. Well, so far, I, I haven't heard anyone who's had uh, uh, a career path that they knew that they wanted to do when they were young in high school and who've arrived there. Let's see if uh, any of our other candidates um, have had a straight path to their career right now. Melissa, you're up. So I'm sorry to say, Christina, that you are not getting a straight path from me either. Um, so I left university, no, I left high school thinking I was going to be an anthropologist. And then I was going to become a sign language interpreter. Now I am a general manager for an IT consulting firm. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a change in history. So let me give you a little bit more information to kind of fill in those details. When I was in high school, I didn't take computers at all. Um, and the job that I have right now doesn't exist, didn't exist at the time. So I never could have said, hmm, I want to be an IT consultant. That simply wasn't a thing. 
Um, I ended, I focused mostly on art, uh, mostly on social studies and mostly on languages. Um, at the time I was, I knew languages were one of my passions. They're actually still one of my passions. I just weave it into my world um, that I work in today. And I um, was convinced that anthropology was the thing. And as I was going through my day-to-day -day life, I realized that really what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that I was never bored. Um, this is the thing that I want to do. And if um, at some point, and someone may have talked to you about this before, but I was always focused on what are my values? And my values for me, one of them includes always learning. Um, so I started to work towards finding ways to always learn. And at the time, I was working at a call center um, and I uh, realized I was really good at patterns and I was really good at problem solving and being creative, which was something that Kendra brought up from her art history. And I was able, um, I realized that I could take the fact I was good at patterns and very creative and start to figure out what was wrong, um, how to break technology. And then once I finished breaking it, I realized I had to fix it and I got really good at fixing it. So I ended up ingratiating myself to a technology department at my company because they would always contact me to say, hey, this thing is broken, what's going on? And the next time a job opened, I applied to become a help desk analyst. And then I started to help other people fix the things that they have broken. And I don't wanna just go through like stage by stage every part of my career, but essentially my point is that I, I never looked and said, okay, five years from now, what am I going to be? I'm going to be a help desk analyst. Or five years from now, what am I going to be? I'm going to be a database administrator. And these are things that I have now been in my career. But I always was going, okay, what, what is the next thing that makes me excited? And then I would go and find that path. And the more that I did that, the more I learned about myself. And the more I started to be able to say, okay, my values are I like to learn. I like to help people, which is why I'm on this call, so that I can answer any questions that we have and give the message that if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, that's okay. Because even if you ask me right now, what do I want to be when I grow up? I'm not going to be able to tell you. I don't know what I'm going to be next. I'm going to be somebody else. You never know. Maybe I'll go and do my job in Europe. But I've always been trying to find different ways to learn and different ways to grow. Um, and try and follow what makes me happy and find a way to find a job that gives me 80% of what will make me happy. And then the 20% you still have to do. Um, I think that's all I want to say right now. I've probably talked at least long enough <laughs> to give you an idea and to make Christina's point that we, none of us have these law, the, these direct paths. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melissa. I see um, a few themes kind of emerging here. Uh, all of you have uh, have tried to overcome challenges. So whether that's problem solving or <laughs> moving to a new different country to learn and, and study, or just to to solve those those problems, challenges, that seems to be another theme that is uh, running through um, similarly in your pathways so far. Um, before we get into more of the questions, we still have, um, Kathy to, uh, hear from and see how, what she does in terms of hmm. science, technology, engineering, arts, math. Kathy, where, where does your, what do you do and where does your career fit in here? Sure. Hi, I am uh, as well very happy to uh, join this call and share uh, my experience and my career path. Um, a little bit different than uh, all the other panelists. I've always been an interior, interior designer. I've practiced interior design for 32 years and uh, still love it very much. Uh, my path has changed like uh, throughout the 32 years, obviously. Uh, I started out uh, after graduation uh, in the government, uh, in facility management, doing large uh, fit-up projects for the government. Uh, my first project I was on uh, was Plasteville Tower C. It's a 29-story building that we had to completely gut, and so we had to move everyone out. Uh, do all of the architectural drawings for uh, the spaces and uh, move them all back in. So from start to finish, uh, we were involved and it was a five-year project. 
so that kind of led my career path into doing uh, large uh, fit-up projects for uh, government and commercial spaces. And I left the government because I always kind of felt that it wasn't the spot I wanted to be as a designer. I wanted to be in the private sector. So I left the government and worked for another company, uh, Taylor Irving and Associates. And then after about seven years, uh, they decided they were going to retire and wanted me to purchase their business. And um, so I ended up never having any business experience, but uh, starting my own business. And um, that was uh, very challenging <laughs> because I wasn't trained to, you know, do risk management, financial management and all of that stuff, HR, all of it. Uh, all of a sudden I was doing that as well as design. So I, um, yeah, I've been operating Hay Design Incorporated in Ottawa. Um, for 16 years and I've expanded. I have another location in Perth where we do all residential design and I have a uh, furniture and decor store as part of that uh, business. And then recently I uh, decided I wanted to uh, become a realtor as well. So I am uh, selling and buying real estate and uh, for people. So it's uh, it's been a very interesting path and I didn't know where I was going to end up when I started but uh, I'm uh, I love it. Kathy so many different jobs you've been an entrepreneur you're starting a new career partly now in real estate um, in design. Do you have a favorite? Hmm. Uh, I just love working with people and uh, I, I, both the, the design and the real estate uh, connects be, me with people and uh, I love working with people and as well sharing my experiences with other people. So, um, And when, when, you were in, when you were young, when you were in high school, you said you've always, you always knew you wanted to be a, a designer. Um, what did you do to hone those creative artistic skills? Uh, when you were younger? Well, uh, I think it was the drafting courses in high school that uh, got me interested in design because it's not it's not about decorating, right? Like what I do is architectural drawings for um, renovations, new homes, additions, uh, commercial spaces. And so it's very technical. And that's what I enjoyed as well about it. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to get into some of the questions that uh, that students and, and teachers had. Um, let's see. One of the questions that that came up um, throughout the past month, I guess, submitted by teachers and students was how has COVID affected the work that you do? Um, uh, Min, uh, it'll be an obvious one for you. You've uh, not been able to go into the mental health area. Uh, you're probably working strictly on, on COVID issues now. Is that correct? Yeah, no, that's, that is correct. Um, I, I mean, it's, um, it's very, um, uh, how, how do I say this? We, it's something we've seen before in other pandemics. So there's a bit of experience building up. Uh, we sort of anticipate this, this, this what is happening, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's um, in times of uh, emergency, uh, people are, are pulled from their uh, regular positions to, to, to help out with, with certain things. And, uh, um, you know, it's more than, and happy to do that. That's actually it's quite exciting and not exciting in a, you know, in a, in a good way that we're having a lot of people who, who you know, have passed away in this and, and uh, you know, people who get infected in this. But in terms of the day-to-day -day work, you know, um, we need to adjust, um, our, our priorities change. Um, and, and certainly, um, you know, I've been on this uh, on a full-time basis for, for quite some time now. And um, yeah. Has COVID affected anyone else's work? Um, is there less work? Is there more work? Has your work changed? 
So for us, actually, we ended up having more work because we end up, we work in the risk industry. Um, we provide technology solutions to help organizations figure out what do they do if a business, um, if something negatively impacts their business. And frankly, a pandemic has, a, has had a massive negative impact on business, which has made everybody realize the importance of the particular industry. Um, but now I do it all from home. So I used to travel probably once a month, um, if not more. And we've gone from me being on a plane all the time to me being on video calls all the time. And it's tried, we've had to shift the way we think about our business and the way that we, we think about our work-life balance too, because if somebody's in meetings from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and then they also have to do work on top of that, how do we manage that? And how do we manage the mental health of the people who work for us? Because this is a stressful time for everybody and trying to find that empathetic and caring balance has been a little bit of a, an interesting challenge for us. And I think we're doing the best we can, just like everybody. Thank you. Hi, Do Christina. Any... Yep. I Cindy? just want to add in. So um, COVID-19 definitely changed the how we do our job and also changed, uh, changed uh, um, um, some areas of our, our daily work. Um, so first of all, you we used to go to the bank for all the, you know, um, transactions and requests and needs but nowadays we don't allow everybody to come in for everything we, we eliminated the face-to-face -face interactions as as much as possible and that I would say thanks to technologies we were able to make the switch very fast um, in, or, as early as in April last year, we were able to send half of our employees back home um, to meet clients online through video and through phone. And we have improved so many technologies to verify IDs remotely, to, to allow our clients to do their banking remotely, et cetera, et cetera. That's the first thing that changed dramatically because of COVID. The second thing, the second thing is, um, we we reached out to many people who ended up having difficulties, financial difficulties because of COVID-19. So people who lost their job, who lost the stable income, the business who are struggling uh, with, you know, paying their rent, paying their employees. So that became a the the highest priority of uh, of our work. So we reach out to people who are um, impacted by COVID-19, we, we try to find the solutions, customize the solutions for everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question in the, in the chat and I invite teachers to type in any questions that their classes might, might have here. Um, and this one could be for anyone to, to answer. Um, for someone who doesn't know what they want to do when they grow up, What's some advice? What are some of the first steps that uh, you could recommend that students, young people take to explore different jobs, different occupations? And this one is uh, open to anyone. The advice that I have is just to explore, just play around with anything that interests you. Uh, from my experience, I had a bunch of hobbies, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do as a career. So I just explored different hobbies. I explored law, something that interested me for a little bit. I did a co-op placement just to see what it was like. Um, I did a couple of university tours and sat in in a couple of classes uh, just to see what the different classes were about, what subjects interested me, if I wanted to be a little bit more hands-on or if I wanted to be more in the books. Um, I just explored all my options. I think you'll yeah, be, be okay with realizing that you're going to make a couple of steps and you might turn around at some point. Like, be okay with the idea that you, you may never actually know the answer to that question. And you may just be able to say, oh, this is what I want to do right now. And be okay with realizing you may go to university for a course or for a degree and you may end up changing that degree. Or you may go to college for a certificate or for, for a program and you may change your mind that you don't want to do that. That's not failure. That's learning. You now know more about yourself than you did before. And then just keep keep moving forward. Just keep taking one step in front of the other and you, you will be okay. It will be fine. 
Yeah, I totally agree. Just keep learning and uh, get experience and uh, let the path take you wherever it's going to take you. I mean, I've been learning my whole career throughout and just developing myself as, a, as an interior designer. Then I was a project manager. I have uh, uh, sustainable design. So it, you just keep growing as a person and it's all good. Enjoy it. And uh, for me, um, because I, I grew up in a different country and a different culture background, for me, when I was a high school student, nobody ever asked me what you want to be in the future. Um, all I was taught was to do what you are supposed to do, um, find a job, earn money, get married, and whatever. So um, I, I really, I'm really jealous of uh, the young people here on our event today. Uh, you have so many resources, you have so many mentors that you can reach out to, take advantage of those, those resources. Um, well, I didn't know what I wanted to be, but uh, there was a little thing that I think I did right, is I think in a backward way, I, I, I try to figure out what I don't want to do, what I don't like. So... I, um, I, I knew I didn't like the peer competition. I didn't like the stress from the society. I didn't like to, you know, think too much about uh, the, the sink cost, what I've already put into. Um, so that, uh, that's why I made the decision to move to a different country, to try new things, to reach out to people. So if you are really not, if you are like myself, if you are not a person with a lot of hobbies, with a lot of passions, you can fr go from that point to what you don't want to do. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. You can learn a lot from mistakes as well. You have to try different things. You have to talk to different people. And listening to the speakers here today is one of those first steps is listening to other people talk about what they do. And this is where your questions will stem from. Maybe not today, but down the road. And it's important to have those, those chats with, with people. And even um, Min suggested uh, he, had, he had a mentor who was very influential in um, his career path. Talk to people. Talk to people in areas you might want to further explore. Uh, it is difficult in these times to get volunteer experience. Um, almost, not quite, but almost impossible to get that face-to-face -face, uh, interaction um, with people. Uh, but there are still ways to get information about the different occupations that are out there. Um, we do have a couple more questions in the uh, chat. Um, the next one is, how important was your high school experience in developing the work ethic that you have today? So work ethic, I think all of you, based on your continuous learning and challenging yourselves in different areas, um, have developed uh, excellent work ethic to get to where you are. So did anything in, in your high school experience help shape that work ethic? For me, I'm going to say no. Um, my high school, uh, when I was a high school student, I wasn't a very good one. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't enjoy school. Um, I, I enjoyed my social life as a teenager, um, probably a little bit too much. But um, when, I, when I started working, I really started focusing and um, became really determined just to excel and learn and grow and and now to teach and, uh, and just, um, I, I don't know, I think it was embedded in, into me, maybe through my family, my father, um, I don't know, I just, a mentor, I had a really good mentor and I had a really good team that I started working with when I was in the government doing that project. And that really developed um, myself as a person and uh, my work ethics. <clears throat> How about the rest of the panelists? When when did did your work ethic start to develop? 
Uh, hi, Christina. I think I couldn't agree more with Kathy. Um, the personalities, the qualities of um, that that help um, with my work ethic. Most of them was developed because of my family, because of my my education throughout the years I grew up. Right. So working in the financial industry, um, I really honor the. Um, importance of being honest. So being honest with myself, being honest with my clients, and being honest with um, um, with every sentence that I speak out. Um, so I'm. I have always been a fan of compliance, regulation, and rules. I I didn't know where that come from, but I would see from my parents and my family. Thank you. Now, um, if, Min? if I could add to that, my for me was you know I um, I love high school, um, but I you know up until I would say grade eleven, um, academic wasn't really um, my prime focus. Even though my parents wants me to achieve academically, you know. And, you know, I always get nervous when it comes to get a report card, like, oh, wow, you know, this is going to tell how hard I work or did not work. Uh, I like the high school for the after school, before school, you know, I always try to cram in my work so that I could put my assignment in so that I could, you know, play sports after or, or something like that. But I still remember one uh, one thing that really got my uh, trigger, um, you know, my interest in, in science. It wasn't, actually, it wasn't a science class at all. It was um, a photography class. Um, this is, was an elective that I took. And back then we didn't have digital cameras. You know, we have those 35 millimeter cameras where you take the negative and you go into this dark room and you develop it and, you know, and you have to mix all these different chemicals in order to get all these exposure, become a picture. And the cool thing was I was able to play with how long I exposed these film and get different, completely different effects out of it. And I thought, oh wow, this is really cool. So that hands-on experience out of science actually taught me about science and you know and I, I went through high school i think it was okay um but back then we had a grade 13 at the time so i knew that i had to do well in grade 13 in order university that's when i you know put all my effort into academic but i think up to that point you know it was just yeah you know life was good you know i just have to do these math assignments to hand in the science you know to hand in but you know i meet the criteria um, but I said, like, sometimes you learn math and science outside of math and science. And, and, and that's when, you know, it really got me triggered. Like, how, how do I get these negatives into these pictures? And, and I, I love just black and white photos. You know, it's just, 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 it's just there's something so beautiful about it that, that got me interested in, in, in the science side. Um, and that goes back to high school. Thanks. Very interesting. Thank you. Any other comments? I have some more questions for you guys. Um, <laughs> kind of on the same topic from the students are, what, what are some of the biggest problems that you might've faced when figuring out what you wanted to do or what you wanted to be? Um, I know some of you, Melissa, are still figuring out what you wanna be when you grow up, but what are these how, days? how do you go about doing that? I think the hardest thing I faced was the pressure I put on myself to figure out what I wanted to be and like figure out what I, um, how um, I needed to be in a career. And I was, it was never, it was never good enough. Like I, I was, I was never good enough. And I was always trying to like put more and more pressure. And there was, there was a while there and I think it was like my mid twenties and I don't recommend waiting until your mid twenties, please learn from me and learn this now. I realized that the pressure I was putting on myself wasn't helping. And I was just stressing myself out about, I needed to have a career and I, I needed to have in my mind, I needed to have a career that I went to university for because I didn't go to university for computers. I didn't even take computers in high school because I didn't think I was going to use them. Um, but I, I, I just, I kept on, kind of like nagging myself in my head and saying, okay, you've got to get this. You've got to get your career. And I said, well, I have a career. I'm in a career right now. And it's a pretty good one. And it's okay that I didn't check all the boxes that I thought I needed to check when I was in high school and in university. So be kind to yourself. And as you go through this journey and don't tell yourself you have to hit a destination that 
you have predisposed in your mind that you have to hit um, or that maybe your parents are telling you you have to hit or that you've taken from TV or anything like that. If you don't answer the question of what you want to be, again, it will be okay. <laughs> now, Melissa, you work in the IT field. Yes. How did you learn those IT skills, those technical skills? I taught myself. Um, so I ended up going and I would read books and I would go and experiment. So, um, of course, this is me showing my age. I was doing coding in the age that the internet was new and um, development was done in notepad rather than in fancy tools. But I went, and I, I, I went and I found examples of code online that did sort of what I wanted. And then I broke the code and then I fixed it. Um, and I would look at examples of things that other people had done in the past. Like when I was in my professional career, I would look at SQL scripts and then I would go and, and learn it. And then Google became a thing and I started Googling it instead and learning it from online um, to Google. So now I feel ancient. Thanks. <laughs> well, th thank you for sharing that. And, and so one of the, th like the common things I'm hearing here too, is that th you're learning it doesn't stop, right? Yeah. Um, whether whether you're working with infectious diseases or um, you're designing, uh, you're even um, Kathy, like you're learning new things because you're now going, you're expanding your repertoire and and going into real estate, and presumably you have to pass some tests and examinations in order to get your certifications for that too. So that continuous learning is, is very important. A um, few more questions from the students here. These are tough ones, guys. Uh, what, do you, what can you say to your parents when they start putting pressure on you to decide what you're going to do after high school? I'm not a parent, so I can't really speak from that perspective, but um, I think an overall theme with parents is that they just want you to be happy. So if you're doing something that makes you happy in your life, whether that is kind of a traditional path or not, I think that your parents would be happy if you approach them and, and say it in a way that this is something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I aspire to do and, and I aspire to continue learning in this realm. Um, I think if you just approach it in a way that has good values behind the reasoning for the re for the choices that you're making. I think that they'll be happy that you're making a choice for yourself. Absolutely. Anyone else care to tackle that question? I think that was a great answer, Kendra. Um, uh, I, I would the, definitely share share that that view as well. Um, I, I and one thing I just want to say too is you know. It took me a long time to uh, realize myself that, uh, you know, as a student, um, you are actually a teacher in some way, too. Because one of the things that I really like about working with students is actually learning from them, you know, and they have ideas that, that you sometimes don't think of. And so it takes a bit of confidence to say something, you know, like you, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I don't teach high school, but I, I certainly uh, at Carleton University when I, you know, students comes up with ideas that just it just fascinates me and I say well, how did you get there like what kind of thinking did you apply to get there because I, I, I would never come up with, with something like that and we would work backwards and I think that's the most enjoyable thing about uh, working with students is learning from them so students like you have to look at it in a different angle you know where a student is now the instructor because you no know, teacher it doesn't matter how trained you are there's always that learning that you do and and students makes that process uh, like really enjoyable. We had another question about um, maybe summer jobs and part-time jobs and if they could be helpful in exploring careers. Um, finding jobs during these times can, can be very challenging. Um, one thing that I can suggest for that is, uh, and some of the, the panelists have mentioned this already, is whatever part-time job you have, um, you might find, or whether it's a co-op job um, or a summer job, you will learn some things that you really like to do, some things that you're really good at, as well as things that you don't want to do for the rest of your life. So um, this brings us to the, the topic of, of skills. What skills 
uh, would you say soft skills, hard skills, transferable skills uh, are important for your jobs, the jobs that you do today? For myself, uh, I would say number one is communication. Communication, communication, communication. Um, it affects everything we do and uh, it affects, you know, when we're working with clients and um, <clears throat> what they are expecting from us and what we are delivering from to them. Uh, if we don't communicate it, they're not going to be happy. <clears throat> so number one, communication. And communication, that's something you can, you know, you, you can get experience in communicating with colleagues, with other people, um, that could be, you know, through a part-time job, through a summer job. So excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, Christina. I want to add uh, something. Um, I would say I would emphasize again on um, being honest and being genuine. So um, for what I do, I need to to earn the trust from my clients probably within the first 30 seconds after I met them. Um, and um, I, what I think most helpful is just being honest. So show your genuine care and, and um, don't, you know, don't speak up fancy things to, to attract their attention, but uh, just to, you know, um, being, being honest with, with every, as I said, with every sentence you see. And I believe this kind of skill can be learned um, every day, no matter what you do, no matter it's a part-time part -time job or, or, or if you are hanging out with, with friends or, or if you're talking to anybody on the street. Thank you. I would add as well, um, curiosity as well as assuming positive intent. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what I mean, but curiosity in that if you're, if something isn't working or it's not um, going the way you're expecting and getting curious about it, and this can be in inner relationships, like connecting back to being uh, communication skills. So you're trying to get something across and you've said this word, this sentence maybe five times and the, the other person doesn't understand it which is something I may have experienced once or twice in my life. Um, but getting curious as to why that's happening. And then that also comes down to assuming positive intent while you're working with other people and other personalities, you're going to find people you don't like, and you're going to find people that annoy you and you're going to find um, customers or clients that don't, that, that, that don't quite connect with you. But if you always assume that everybody around you is doing the best they can, I promise you your life will be so much easier and less painful and you won't be as angry. Like if somebody, a really simple example, if somebody cuts in front of you and while you're driving your car or cuts in front of you in line, maybe assume that they're really stressed and they're having a bad day or they didn't see you rather than assuming they're entitled. And it just, I find in my day-to-day -day life and in my day-to-day -day career, it makes things so much easier if I assume everyone's doing the best they can. Thank you, Melissa, for answering the next question that the students submitted on how do you overcome hurdles and obstacles that you encounter along your journey? And that is the best answer that I've, I've <laughs> heard is uh, that positivity, especially during the time, these times when everyone is so stressed. Uh, keep, keep up. All of you are also positive. Um, please keep it up. And hopefully some of that will rub off on some of the students that are listening today. Um, on that topic of, of being passionate and uh, motivated, what keeps you motiv motivated? And I wanna hear an answer from each of you um, before we wrap up for the day. What keeps you motivated? Um, can we start with Kendra? Sure. Uh, so what keeps me motivated is that I love what I do, basically. Um, it's something that I've worked hard at figuring out what I want to do. And I'm, I'm really happy with the, I guess, the end goal of where I'm at right now. Um, so what keeps me motivated is that I work so hard to get where I am. And I want to keep working at that. And I want to keep learning and keep growing. Um, I take training courses all the time just to keep learning and be... I guess the best that I can be within the role that I'm given right now. 
Um, I like making sure that I have all the certifications that I need and everything like that. So my motivation is, I guess, making sure I have a, a good baseline for everything that I need right now. Excellent. Cindy? I would say my biggest motivation is the people around me. Um, I always get inspired by uh, by the good qualities and, and that people around me show in at the in their every day. I feel, oh, I want to be as passionate as maybe this colleague. I want to be as curious as Melissa. Uh, I want to, you know, continue work, continue learning like what Kathy did in her career. So I look at those those, um, you know model figures and I feel inspired by their story I want to be like them so that's my biggest motivation thank you Kathy um, running a business is tough running multiple businesses um, is even tougher uh, how do you stay motivated um, I, I set goals I'm very goal oriented um, you know at the beginning of the year it, at the end of the year, I'm setting goals for the next year. Um, I'm monitoring it. I'm, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think well, if you don't set the goals, goals, you can't reach them, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I didn't really know where I was going, but this is, uh, I don't know. I just keep learning too. That keeps me motivated. Learning and, and, and looking at problems and challenges like mm -hmm. has been the theme throughout. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Min, I mean, you're you're working with a national crisis. Uh, it must be difficult to uh, stay motivated when you're trying to solve uh, a pandemic. How do you stay motivated? Well, you know, I, I don't solve pandemics as often. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, I. I for me, has always been, you know, back to the basics. Um, uh, you know, learning. Like the, I think that learning is is a cliche is so true that you never stop. Um, you know, you keep on learning. But the critical thing is having fun learning. You know, uh, I I always emphasize with my uh, my team is that you know the moment you don't have fun, it becomes work. You know, but if you're having fun, it just you keep on it just just snowball. And take the learning a little step further in that, you know, developing new tools and, and that kind of thing. Um, I, I always tell my students when I, you know, I first um, supervised them, I said, you know, up to now, you know, you, you've learned that one plus one is two. You go to your exam and, you know, you get two, you get an A plus, your report card, that's great. I said, from now on, you need to look at the opposite way. You know, when do one plus one does not equal to two? And this is the, 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 the thing that I always, you know, and, and I demonstrate them. Here it is, one plus one equals three. And, and I prove it to them, you know, this, this is the kind of critical thinking and learning you need to sort of develop. Because in this modern world, there are so many tools out there, unlike before. You know, um, I, I think, Christine, you just had some props that you need. Uh, my prop has always been, you know, this big calculator. You know, we we'll use this old-fashioned calculator. And my daughter, eight years old, she gave me this giant eraser and it says for really big mistakes so i make I a lot of it. mistakes <laughs> <laughs> and so those are the two tools that i often use and i tell kids you know i students I, I work with learn keep learning having fun learning think of ways to look at, at the same numbers in a different way and, and and find discovery that's that's keeps you excited motivated and uh, and progress awesome thank you melissa there we go. Couldn't get my mute off. Um, I'm going to actually throw a little bit of a wrench in this and say that I'm not always motivated. Um, I'm not always waking up every day super excited about what I do or where I'm going or what my day is supposed to look like. Um, I'll give you actually a really random example, which is that um, after this meeting today, uh, my day, I am not motivated about it at all. I have a lot to do. <laughs> Don't tell Joel. Um, <laughs> Christina is one of the people who works in my company. Um, but the um, what I do is I tend to try and think about, again, I get curious and I try and think about the big picture. And I always tell myself that this is a journey and this will get better. So I won't always feel like I want to do the work I need to do. I'm not going to always feel like I love my job. 
Um, I'm probably one of those people who um, I, I, I get um, challenged by um, striving. And it can be very exhausting after a while because if you're always learning, you're always trying to grow and you're always looking for the next thing, you actually never feel like you're like, ah, I've arrived, I'm done, I don't have to work hard anymore. I'm always trying to work hard. And that can get very exhausting. Um, so what I do is I create patterns and habits that help keep me moving towards the pattern of success. So I try and make sure that I keep my time organized so I know what do I need to do when? And even if I'm not motivated, I still have to do it because if I don't, the negative impact is bigger than the benefit I get from slacking off. So it, it's really start to think again, get curious about the things that will help keep you moving forward in the direction that you want to go, even if you don't want to do it. Um, and be prepared for some days when you don't want to do the things you need to do. And again, that's okay but you may still have to do it. <laughs> Great piece of advice for students, whether they're in high school or college, university, as well as, as adults. Um, I see we're running out of, of time here. Students are having to get to their next classes. So just to wrap up in um, one sentence or less, I wanna hear from everyone again, um, a, maybe a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self, your high school self. And uh, we'll start with Cindy. I think Cindy may have accidentally dropped and she may need to hear your question again. <laughs> okay, well, we won't start with Cindy. We'll go right to Kendra. Kendra, any advice for your younger self? I think that we will never know exactly what we want to do in our life. But I think that being close enough is is always a good starting point, just figuring things out one step at a time. Great. Min, advice for your younger self before we we end off here? I I think one of the key thing is is to realize what, what you're passionate about, what what would you like. And 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 I think focus on on those those qualities. Um, it's uh, it's a very young solid grounds. Excellent. Kathy? Uh, advice for my younger self uh, would be to uh, not uh, have uh, work absorb 100% of your uh, world and your life and uh, always remember your family and your loved ones and spend time with them and have fun and enjoy your life as well as work. Right. And Cindy, um, any advice for your younger self? Yeah, I would say get out there. <laughs> Excellent. So, Excellent. Yeah, talk to more people, learn more about the different jobs in this world, try new things, don't be shy. Awesome. And uh, Melissa, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, I think my advice to my younger self is the sort of the theme I've been repeating over and over, which is it will be OK. Um, like, I, I think that a, a lot of the time I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed. And I had these preconceived motions, uh, uh, notions as to what success looked like. And um, it really was that this is a journey and you're not going to just suddenly be like, OK, I'm grown up now. I'm done. I've hit my career. Everything is fine. Um, so I think that would be my advice is that this is a journey and not a destination. Awesome. Well, on that note, um, we have run out of time. So I just want to end by taking a deep breath and thanking all of you guys so much for sharing those journeys with us, with the students. And hopefully um, this will give a little bit of food for thought for students to not worry so much about the job or the career that they're going to do, but um, start planning their journey and um, how they're going to get there. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank, thank you, you and so much. On behalf of everyone at the Ottawa Catholic School Board and the uh, Ottawa Public Board who are joining us today, I just want to thank Christina for organizing this and our guests for um, coming and sharing so openly your 
journey in your career. Uh, I think it was fantastic. And there were some things that really stuck out to me, taking advantage of opportunities. None of you said you were motivated to get the highest paying job you could get. You all talked about enjoyment of the work, enjoyment of the people around you, continuous learning and goal setting. And I think that's a really good message is that if you follow what you enjoy, um, then things will fall into place. So it's not something that students need to, to worry so much about. It's just take advantage of the opportunities that come your way and try to figure out what you like. Or as Cindy said, try to figure out what you don't like. Um, and that'll help guide you. So I appreciate you all so much. And uh, thank you again to our, our guests in the schools who are joining us.